Looks like we have a smaller group for the medical and health benefits compared to the money-making benefits. Why am I not surprised? Uh, my name is Lanny Swardlow. I am the chair and founder of the Brownie Mary Democrats of California. We are one of only seven statewide democratic organizations actually chartered by the California Democratic Party. We are part of the party. And we work within the party to pass legislation that is uh, for the benefit of access to cannabis. The example of one, uh, back in 2014, we introduced a plank to the California party platform calling for the party to support the legalization of marijuana. Up until that point, they had always rejected it, including in 2010 when they rejected supporting Proposition 19. It did get passed and became the official part position of the th largest political party in the, state of, in, the, in the United States and also the political party that controls the fifth largest economy in the world. We are effective in getting legislation through. We introduced a resolution calling on uh, the parties uh, to support or to condemn hospitals that had been denying organ transplants to medical marijuana patients. At that point, if you were a medical marijuana patient, you couldn't get an organ transplant. We got the resolution passed by the party, and the following year, we got the California state legislature to enact a law making it illegal for hospitals to <laughs> deny organ transplants. So, we are continuing to work within the party for access, and I hope you will hit me up after uh, this presentation, and I'll talk politics instead of health. <laughs> I became involved in the medical marijuana movement back in 1995 when I lived in Oregon, and I was a caretaker for a friend of mine who had contracted AIDS. This was a roly-proly person who could waste it away to next to nothing due to the ravages of that disease. And I found that his use of cannabis helped stimulate his appetite so he'd keep his weight on. Back then, they were taking a literal cocktail of medications. He had 20 different medications that he was taking, all kinds of horrible negative side effects. The cannabis helped mitigate the side effects so he would stay compliant with his medication. Back in 1995, AIDS was considered a terminal disease. You got AIDS, you died. Kind of depressing. And his use of cannabis helped stimulate, helped keep his spirits up so he's, he was, you know, feeling better. So what did I have to do, what did his friends have to do in order to get him medicine that would help him have a better sense of his well-being, help him stay compliant with his medication, help him eat and keep his weight on? We had to go out in the streets and deal with criminals to get his medication. Well, fortunately, California led the way in 1996 with Proposition 215, Cal Oregon follows quickly afterwards in 1998. And we now have legal cannabis throughout the state of California and in nine other states and Washington, D.C., and more will be coming. Now, this is going to have an amazing impact on the health and medical benefits of cannabis and access for people to it, and that's what we're going to be addressing in this panel today. So, uh, I'm going to let each panel, I gave you a little quick rundown on, on me, but I'm going to ask each panelist to kind of talk a little bit about themselves and, and what their organization and what they are doing uh, to help spread the health and medical benefits of cannabis. Hi, my name is Yami Bolaños, and I'm first to patient. But I also opened the seventh store in the city of Los Angeles, started the first trade organization in the United States for medical cannabis, and passed a law that was for transplant patients. I'm, the cannabis changed, not only changed my life, it gave me back my life. And I'm here today because I think that the patients have been forgotten. And I think that we need to remind the industry, the industry that we were a community at one time and that the patients matter. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Christy Amobi, and um, I'm here representing Revlon. Uh, at Revlon, we provide education to help people understand how to use cannabis in microdoses for stress and sleep. You might be wondering, well, of all the things that cannabis is, is great for, why stress and sleep? It's really related to my own personal story of um, choosing cannabis to help manage uh, my stress and help aid my sleep um, in lieu of pharmaceuticals. I had a pretty profound experience 
relatively new to the industry. Um, this is a passion project for me. I, I wrote a guide to help people get started, really trying to um, educate people about the endocannabinoid system, things that Peter was talking about earlier, um, and promoting the wellness effects of, of cannabis for people who are currently using prescription medication um, for, for stress and sleep. Hi there, um, my name is Candace Haas. I'm the director of Orange County Normal. Normal is, stands for the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. For any of you that are, those that aren't familiar with it, we've actually been around since the 70s. Um, our chapter in Orange County has been around since 2003. Um, so we hold educational meetings every month, teaching people about legislation that will affect them, also have speakers on health and wellness. Um, aside from that, I also run a, a consulting company that provides community outreach services to dispensaries. Um, and one of the most successful things that we've been doing is a free senior shuttle that we run <clears throat> from retirement homes to the dispensaries, providing education um, and uh, a really cool experience for seniors. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Hi, my name is Sean Kern. I'm the CEO of the Weed for Warriors Project, which is a, we have chapters internationally, but across the country. We're huge in California with now 18 chapters from San Diego all the way up to Humboldt. We meet once a month and get veterans in uh, and we give away free cannabis. Uh, that's become significantly harder with Prop 64 and especially with the co-op model expiring in January. But it continues illegally and it will continue until uh, we're stopped, which will be never. <laughs> okay. What, um, there's a lot of different health and medical benefits of cannabis. What in your eyes is the most important one that you are working on and why? Um, <laughs> cannabis gave me back my life. I laid in bed for four and a half years and Stanford University and UCLA couldn't come up with the medications that I needed. Everything that I took made me feel sick. So I think <laughs> I, I drink it, I eat it, I smoke it, I rub it on myself. Um, the effects, the medical, positive medical effects of cannabis are limitless. And um, I believe that all use is medical. All use is medical, even recreational use. All use is medical. Uh, related to that, I, I, saw, I have a similar point of view. Obviously, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, my focus is in stress and sleep, um, you know, specifically in the area of sleep currently uh, just in the United States. People living here are spending over $3 billion on um, sleep aids, and um, including natural sleep aids as well. However, if you look at some of the side effects, uh, Peter was also talking about benzodiazepines. So those are the, the cl classification of drugs that are the sedatives. So Ambien is very popular as a sleep aid. Xanax is very popular as an anti-anxiety drug. These are very, very powerful drugs that are pretty much given out without a lot of education, um, without a lot of information by physicians. I'm not saying that there's not a place for these prescription medications, um, but for me personally and in the people that I'm talking to, as you get a greater education about cannabis, about the endocannabinoid system, about the side effects of cannabis, you definitely see an opportunity to replace some of those pharmaceuticals, especially the benzodiazepines, guys. These are the ones that are like the hardcore sedatives. They have very well-documented side effects, like if you've heard of the ambient sleepwalking, um, this is, you know, people have um, essentially do things like cook entire meals um, while they're asleep. Um, waking up groggy, um, and then they become addicted to these medications as well. So um, I'm very passionate about this topic. I think that it's a great way to try to bring new, um, new consumers, new patients. Again, I don't really make a distinction between consumers and patients. I think especially with stress and sleep that there's, a, I call it wellness, you know, it's, it's not really about using it recreationally, it's not about using it medically, it's about using it for your well-being. And there's a lot of halo effect with mood, the moods being uplifted in low doses. Um, so, so by that I'm going lower than Peter was talking about. So Peter was talking about low doses being 11 milligrams um, of THC per dose. So I'm, I'm down at five. 
And, and most people, I would say, should start with something more in the, the two, one to two range in terms of THC content. Again, to provide um, a positive experience, a positive introduction to using cannabis in low doses, you're not going to get the, um, the psychoactivity. You're not going to get the coordination issues, um, you know, no motor impairment in terms of driving, yet you are going to get a really great state of relaxation as well as um, a great night's sleep. So I think we would all like to have that. Okay. Well, one of the things that I think is most popular and very important right now is, is outreach to seniors. There's a lot of seniors that have been taking prescription drugs for a lot of time, long time. Um, they contribute a large portion of the 70,000 people plus that die every year from the opioid epidemic. They also have uh, concerns for falls and trips and broken bones and stuff like that. So I think that's why seniors right now is one of the biggest emerging markets. If you were here earlier for the Ease presentation, um, he said that you know the numbers of seniors using cannabis is up 25% right now and that seniors are 49% more likely to produce, to, re, to replace their prescription medicines and over-the-counter medicines for cannabis. So um, that's why I really love working with this group. They're very open and willing to hear. Like, we don't have other groups of people like soccer moms or anyone that's really that open to learn something new, which is, uh, you know, kind of contrary to what you'd think. You know, these people grew up before the liberal times. You know, they wouldn't be as open to it. But surprisingly, they really are, you know, especially if you come and meet them in a place Place where they're comfortable, you know, come to their senior homes, offer them experience with their peers to learn, to visit. Um, you, a lot of seniors come on the senior shuttles that we do for Bud and Bloom and Modern Buds, you know, with no anticipation of, you know, purchasing a product, just, you know, coming to experience it and learn. And sometimes they'll leave with something to replace a medicine that they're taking and, you know, come back with a really good report. So um, really love working with this group. Um, price is something definitely that affects them a lot. Um, they all live on fixed incomes. Um, so it's surprising I even saw recently at one of my senior shuttles is that seniors are even sometimes willing to go to the black market to get their medicine. So those that we think you know, are the most law abiding want to follow all the rules, you know, price really does mean that much. And we want to make sure that it's available to those people that need it the most, the senior, the seriously ill, and of course our veterans. Lanny, can you repeat the question again? Oh, the question is, what do you think, uh, in you, with what groups that you work with, is the most important health medical benefits of cannabis? I look at it from a risk aversion standpoint with the veterans. Uh, you know, understand this is a substitute to opiates. It's a substitute to benzos we've talked about. It's a substitute to the antidepressants that come with suicidal inclinations. And so when we're talking about the suicide and overdose epidemic that we're seeing throughout the country, which the veterans are just a part of, it's not just veterans, uh, it's a substitute, it's a substitute we need badly. We need access so people can make that free choice, as it was just said earlier. And even at the American Legions, I mean, a lot of the veterans go there and they are, they're drinking and they're smoking and, you know, they need a healthier alternative. Right. I mean, but that, yeah, and that gets into the cultural aspect of how we view it versus the reality. My, my take on it, I'm a registered nurse, and I don't think I ever worked a single shift at a hospital in which I wasn't taking care of somebody in a hospital bed, at least partly due to their use of alcohol. And I consider that to be one of the most important medical and health benefits of cannabis because it is the only, the only effective substitute out there for alcohol use. You know, people like to alter their consciousness. They seem to like altering their consciousness so much, I think there's a genetic predisposition for people wanting to alter their consciousness. And we need to give them something else. And that something else is cannabis. All kinds of studies have shown that when cannabis is easily and widely available, alcohol consumption goes down. And that is a very beneficial thing for the health and safety of our communities. This country spends $200 billion a year from illnesses and accidents to loss, product, loss in productivity due to the use of alcohol. We've got to let people, people want to celebrate, people want to party, people want to socialize, let them use cannabis. And my idea is 
been wanting to start kind of a little health group organization made up of nurses and doctors that to convince doctors, when you go to your doctor for an appointment for any reason, at the end of the appointment, the doctor asks you, um, do you use alcohol? And if you say yes, the doctor says, well, what do you use it for? He says, oh, you know, after work, parties, this kind of stuff. And the doctor says, well, let me give you a suggestion. The next time you want to relax, the next time you want to celebrate, the next time you want to socialize, use cannabis instead of alcohol. And you know what? If a doctor tells that to you, they're going to consider it a lot more likely. And we can reduce the consumption of alcohol in this country dramatically and improve, like I say, the health and safety of our welfare of our communities, reduce all the alcohol-related diseases from pancreatitis to liver disease to brain wasting away. It's tremendous. It's, it's a horrible situation. And cannabis is truly, truly the only alternative. Abstinence from drinking? No, that's not going to work. We tried that with prohibition. Didn't work. But if we give people something else to use and the medical community is telling them to use it, we can reduce alcohol consumption. Could I make a couple of comments about alcohol? Would sure. It, yeah. Um, related to that. Especially if, if it's can, negative. No, <laughs> yes, it's all good. It, I, I've been also talking about that um, in, in, in terms of low dosing as an alcohol substitute or just, um, you know, as, as taking a break. You know, you could take a break from alcohol. You saw that in the data that Peter had shown earlier, you know, people in their group of users saying there had been a 60% reduction in alcohol. A lot of new cannabis consumers do not understand alternate forms of administration, so they think that what we're talking about is go smoke a bowl. <laughs> and there's actually really discreet ways, as, as many of you in the audience know, but you can all be ambassadors for this too, because there's a lot of misunderstanding. You know, tinctures, you can drop a tincture in a margarita mix and have a margarita at your next party and feel amazing the next day. You'll have a great state of relaxation. You'll get that, um, that euphoria that you feel from using cannabis. Um, you won't have to smoke anything and you'll sleep great and you can go catch the, you know, 7 a.m. workout the next day. Um, but I think that by and large, people, you know, and I'm not talking about the people in this room, I'm talking about the people we're going to go talk to tonight and our family members and the people that we work with, they don't know that you can get cannabis in a gel cap. They don't know that you can get a tincture. They don't know that you can do a, a sublingual. Or patch. A patch, <laughs> you know, a transdermal. Um, they may have heard about an edible, but usually if they've heard about an edible, they'll tell you about that awful edible story that they had, right? And that's because they were consuming cannabis in a really high dose and probably didn't have a very good experience. Um, so, Just, just want to make a quick comment about dropping some tea, cannabis oil in the margarita. Cannabis and alcohol don't mix. No, no. If you're a mean, alcohol. nasty drunk, you're going to be even meaner and nastier if you're smoking cannabis <laughs> at the same time. Not don't with the it. alcohol. Not with the alcohol. Just the mix. Oh, just, just a minute. The okay. Mix. All right. Not with the alcohol. Sean, I, isn't alcoholism a problem with veterans and would cannabis, is cannabis being given as an, as an alternative to that? It's definitely a problem with the older vets. Um, yeah, I mean, alcohol, listen, vets want to escape. A lot of times, um, I can tell you from personal experience, to quiet your mind down, you need that alternative substance um, that you touched on earlier. I mean, puffer fishes um, love to get high. I mean, the dolphins love to get hit high off puffer fishes, so we're not the only mammals that do it. <laughs> um, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction, domestic abuse, just fighting, just all the societal issues that we have in general are... are exhibited in veterans. There are good veterans, there are bad veterans, we're just a sub-segment of, of the state. And there's over two million veterans in California, and I will tell you, the biggest impact cannabis has in the veteran community is on the kids, is on the spouses. It's on those people who live with those vets. Um, I can tell you, my kids, and we joke, I mean, it was Christmas and my, uh, my parents were coming over, and the kids said, oh, you better go medicate dad so you can tolerate him. Um, you know, the point being is it's a community and a family uh, acceptable way to take care of things, much more acceptable than the reality of what's going on, not what people think is going on. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. I always like to, yeah, give him a, 
I always like to point out when I give my presentations that when the old man comes home from work tired and stressed out and has a couple beers, beats up the old lady. When the old man comes home all tired and stretched out and has a couple joints, he makes love to the old lady. <laughs> That's the difference. Okay. Um, affordability. Affordability. How does that affect the health and medical aspects? Yes, yeah, Sean, you've got your, you got, you want to talk about that one. <laughs> the, the sad reality is Prop 64 has created two cannabis markets. Oh, yeah. It's created a cannabis market for the privileged, and I don't mean that insultingly, I mean people who have disposable income. Lawyers and doctors, a lot of people in Los Angeles and California. And then it's created a boom in the illicit market because you've decriminalized possession and use and advertised it. And so it is in everyone's interest to get everyone to move from the illicit market to the legal market, especially the patient because of the testing issues and the consistency issues and just education in general. And so when you talk about cost, it's about access. There is no bigger prohibitor for this market right now, bigger impediment than getting towards reality. And that means reality by which your consumer base, your clientele can afford to come to your shop. And that's a function of less regulation, less taxes, and so getting involved is very much what we have to do. Um, two bills that were just introduced last week in the state of California is AB 1536. And it's not just cost, it's just the reality that 80% of the state, you can't even access cannabis geographically. Um, and that's going to require cities and counties that voted for Prop 64 to establish licensed businesses. That's a direct attack on California's famous nimbyism. And then we have AB 1569, which just got put out, um, and I just got off the phone earlier this morning on it. And that, the other issue is we have in California is defining medical versus recreational. The reality is it's all adult use. The only medical determinants is medical card absolutely nobody has gotten. I don't even know what the number, Eric, if you know what that is, or Lanny, if you know what the medical card is. There's, you know, with perhaps in 64, a lot of doctors that are giving out doctor's recommendations yeah. have closed their offices because most people are getting cards just to buy it and they don't need that anymore. So, right. they, they, so the card, the only advantage being a medical marijuana patient really is if you want to grow your own, you can grow more than six plants. But other than that, there's not much of an advantage. You and, do and pay a little bit less taxes if you're a medical marijuana patient. You do well, pay a little less. And okay. 15, well, no, here, let's hit on the medical card you get takes away the sales tax which is about 10% on 35%. It's not as significant. Now we have a couple bills. One, Bonta's bill is trying to lower the excise tax from 15 to 12 or 11, I forget. Ridiculous. And that's important, but I've told them that's not gonna help much. But one thing that's gonna help, and I don't like one part of it, but it is one good thing is AB 1569 is we're directly attacked in this medical card that's useless. You're gonna go back to the old script. If you have a doctor's note or a script, you can remove the sales tax instead of getting the localized state ID card. Now they're only agreed, we were supposed to open that up to everybody. Um, the politicians only agreed to go with veterans who have service-connected disabilities. So we expect that to get passed this year and then we're gonna fight like hell to expand that um, because getting to the whole service-connected part of the veteran, not a lot of you know, but that's a whole other issue with the disability and how we classify things. So there's two bills coming up. And so to your point, cost is the prohibitive factor, not only for patients, but for this industry to grow. Yeah. Because I can tell you right now, I can get cannabis anywhere in the state within a few blocks, and most of it is illicit market, and you have to give patients a reason to be able to medicate legally. Mm -hmm. The health part of it's okay, but it's not enough. Um, I think one thing we're going to have to address is using some of these taxes to subsidize Medicare and 100% disabled patients like they do in Canada. I wish someone had brought that up, and Eric, I suggest we buy that up in Washington, um, following Canada's model. They give three and a half grams of flour free to veterans, and I don't think it should stop at veterans. I think if you're a Medicaid or Social Security disabled person, it should be addressed the same way. But those three and a half grams, if you just do the numbers, times three and a half grams, which is an eighth times 30, and you get up to fourteen to $1,500 after taxes because we buy them in eights. There's really no discounts. That's the cost of medicating for a disabled vet. And his 100% disabled veteran status gets him 2900 and a little less than $3,000 a month. 
and he gets an extra like 50 or 75 if he has a kid or she has a child. And so there's really no money. So the problem is we've created a legal market that market share size is very small just based on the amount of regulation taxes that you can serve. And so the biggest issue we have is an industry, patients and business owners, because we need both, um, is we've got, I mean, I spent the past three weeks in Sacramento and I can tell you, there is no more detached group of people than the politicians. And that's primarily because they come from a special demographic, privilege. Mm -hmm. And that's just reality. Um, on January 1st of last year when <laughs> the tax came into, the, the uh, tax from Prop 64 came into reality. I went into my store and um, I usually get like $200 worth of medication every two weeks, right? And they charged me not $200, but $276. And I almost had a heart attack because that's the tax. In LA, it's 34%. On er so that's $34 for every $100. It, I couldn't believe, it made me so sad because I know patients, real patients, that are not just using it recreation, but need it, like I do, on an everyday basis. I consume at least 150 milligrams of THC a day because that's how sick I am. That's how much I need in order to stay healthy. And if I was just a regular person that didn't own a dispensary, I could not afford to do that. And I think that that's immoral because this industry was built on the patient's backs and that tax was something that they gave to the state as a bribe so they would pass all the freaking laws. And now everybody wants a cut of the pie and the patients are forgotten. So yes, we need to change the taxes. Everybody should call. Last year, I stood in front of my store on 420 and told a thousand patients to call their representatives and tell them the taxes were too high because every person <clears throat> that calls is t represents 10 people. People. That's what I was told from all the times that I've done advocacy. I was kind of upset because I remember standing in line and having people, you know, sign um, petitions so that it would be legal in the city of Los Angeles and nobody, everybody would ignore us. Nobody wanted to participate. But now that it's costing them money, everybody was on the phone. So everybody needs to participate. Everyone needs to call and say, this is ridiculous, this is immoral. For patients, the tax should not be what it is. And going down to 12%, that's silly. Going up to 12%, that's silly. yeah. That's just silly. That doesn't do anything. She's speaking about in Long Beach, um, the adult tax right now is 8%, and it can go up to 12%, yeah. so almost 40%. It's, it's ridiculous. <clears throat> you call your representative. You go and you find out who's representing you, and you call them and tell them, this is ridiculous. You guys are making the illicit market grow. Yeah. Your tax is making the illicit and the outlaws grow. After all the years that we spent trying to be legal, and we begged, we told the city council in LA, let us jump through the hoops like the hoops on fire, we'll jump through them. But this is ridiculous. This is killing the industry, the legal industry, and it's not helping the patients. And that's my biggest gripe about the whole thing is that the patients are The one thing that, the one thing that I might add about cost is that the cost of marijuana is too high. It's $1,000 a pound on the wholesale level. Can anybody else name a plant, an agricultural commodity, then that that's raw form sells for $1,000 a pound? That's absurd. And the reason it's $1,000 a pound is because of the stupid regulations that re restrict agricultural size. All these places are building these million dollar indoor facilities, which is not exactly very green. Instead, cannabis should be treated like any other agricultural crop, whether it's corn or tomatoes, and allow our California farmers to grow hundreds and thousands of acres of marijuana just like they grow tomatoes in greenhouses. And tomatoes grown in greenhouses sell for $2 a pound. <laughs> And if even a cannabis is 10 times more expensive to grow to tomatoes, which it's not, that makes it $20 a pound. And if you have to pay a 100% sales tax on $20 a pound marijuana, and you have to pay $40 a pound for marijuana, who the hell is going to bitch? No one. 
We've got to get the cost of production down, and that's only going to be accomplished when our legislatures undo all these crazy regulations, making it so difficult for our regular farmers who grow all the crops that feed this nation to also be able to grow cannabis. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, one of the issues that's really important is cancer, and there is nothing, uh, cancer, I mean, the research has shown that cannabis can not only prevent cancer, but can possibly cure cancer. Does anybody have any comments on cannabis and cancer? Um, yeah, look at yeah. our cancer survivor. Yeah. Um, I have been lucky enough to witness people who have you know, been cured through the cannabis use. I'm very skeptical when people say just use cannabis and don't use modern medicine because I believe that, you know, that you should do everything possible to help yourself, right? And cannabis can be a tool to get you there. But I've witnessed a lot of people, including myself, that have had a skin cancer situation that went away with prolonged use of cannabis oil. Um, it cures cancer. I think it does well on skin cancer more than any other cancers, because that's what I've witnessed. But, you know, it does. It, it, it does. It, <laughs> I, I, I am in awe of the plant. You guys, if you haven't realized that, the plant gave me back my life. I laid in bed for four and a half years because nothing that Stanford or UCLA gave me worked. And in the first joint that I smoked, I had relief. So for me, and I've witnessed, I've witnessed people come back, and myself, I'm with my skin cancer situation, so I, do, I truly believe that it does work on cancer. And, but I don't want to say that you should only use cannabis. I always say that you should use Western medicine as well because you want to take all that you can to help you get through whatever it is. But cannabis is a very good tool. And there's people that say that only the use of cannabis has cured their cancer. Well, maybe so. Miracles exist. I'm one of them. I got a liver transplant 22 years ago, so. Anybody else? Uh, I would. <clears throat> Go ahead, Kev. Say it, Sean. I, Sean, I would just say that, that you know, in, in one of the questions, it's, it's, it's you know, what's the, the, besides not killing me, is what's important about cannabis. It's a journey. It's my partner on a journey. So especially on the mental side. I mean, I know we talk about cancer, but on the veteran side, so much of cannabis is is dealing with the demons of uh, uh, of trauma that many of us, female, male, young, mostly young, to be very blunt with you, face. And I think someone said it earlier, I think it might have been Eric, who talked about a lot of these things don't manifest themselves until you get older because you don't deal with them correctly. And so really, I would say the thing about cannabis is a partner. Um, you smoke too much of it, you learn. You smoke too little bit, it doesn't help you. Um, you smoke different strains, and, and it really is something that it lets you explore safely those limits by which humans, you know, uh, need to go to understand. And so I think the biggest, uh, you know, benefit, whether it be cancer or the mental side, is you know you'll be safe in the morning. Yeah. And that's the biggest issue. It's a real, re and I think we're selling this wrong, it's a risk reduction trade. And, and I think that the whole argument about the studies missed the point, and they're purposely missing the point because the narrative is controlled by the prohibitionists or the people who are incentivized to it, it is this isn't, this is purely about, let's talk about the alternative substances we use and what those risks are. And that's alcohol, as you stated, but it's a lot more than that, illicit and legal. And so I think, you know, the way cannabis needs to be looked at is it is of itself kind of you're like your own psychologist, your own psychiatrist who helps you explore yourself. And I have found that more successful than all the doctor's appointments in the world. I found that more successful, more healing, um, working with friends and fellow veterans than any of the Western medicine that, that's been brought to the table. And that's not to discount it like you said. I think there's a lot of important things of it. But it really is a partner. We've got just a couple minutes left. Is there any... Anybody here who has any questions of, of the panel they might want to ask? Yes, ma'am. Speak up real loud. That's so funny that you asked that because I thought there's one more thing I wanted to say that nobody's really talked about. 
Um, just recently in Orange County, there's a group called Neomedic that has a program and research that they've been doing in Israel with seniors administrating cannabis directly and doing research and, and care. And they just recently opened up in Orange County inside Saddleback Hospital, inside the Memorial Health Care you know, health group. So that's pretty big. Although they're not covering yet that visit, they are now directing people who could be benefited from cannabis to make an appointment with Neomedic inside the hospital. They get seen by a panel of doctors and then they have a nurse that oversees the, the information and then creates a dosage plan and talks about the best delivery methods. So I think that's groundbreaking. You know, just the fact that this hospital has now welcomed this group inside their doors. Eventually they're hoping to have assistance and pain for the program. Um, and then also <clears throat> another health group that's been notoriously horrible for us has been Kaiser Permanente. Um, they've also just like the VA been restricting people's use of cannabis if they want prescription uh, painkillers. Um, just recently though, a couple months ago, they had Dr. Goldstein give them a, a presentation on cannabis. Um, so that's great so that we may start, start seeing these big healthcare providers opening their doors. Cause you know, it would save them money down the road if they can, you know, move people towards using healthier, you know, alternatives than prescription medicines. Well, they would say, this is when, you know, the insurance industry is supposed to be always worried about their bottom line, and if they were, they would be pushing cannabis tremendously because when people use cannabis, they need far fewer prescription pharmaceuticals. We've seen study after study after study confirm that states that have medical marijuana laws and they have accessibility to cannabis, prescriptions, drug use goes way down, which would save the insurance companies billions. But it just shows you how reefer madness even infects insurance companies. Okay, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. For those of you who didn't hear, the question has to do with medical and the growing of cannabis that's free of pesticides versus organic and so on and so on. So anybody have an answer to that? Well, I think the testing standards are already higher than they need to be. It's already much harder to get a product under the cannabis market than even to the grocery store shelves. Um, there's a company, Canna Craft, that makes uh, blueberries, uh, or yeah, blueberries uh, and strawberries. Um, under Satori, they had to go to France to get strawberries because they couldn't find any in the whole United States that would pass our cannabis testing levels. So um, just kind of wanted to pro provide that information. Yes, Sean. Yeah, I mean, you just hit on a hot button issue. I mean, where do you start? Do you start in the fact that what you just talked about, which is our cannabis testing, is such more, more strict than the food we eat? And in fact, you saw um, Harborside, one of their grows in the valley, they put everyone, oh, we're going to go grow in the valley. But the dust drifts from all the heavy metal dirt and all the pesticides that spray on our farms, you can't pass yeah. your campuses. Or do we start with the fact that anytime you have a for-profit industry, uh, people figure out a way to get around. I was just in Vegas at the cannabis conference, and a bunch of vets bought flour, and they opened up with powdery mildew. They're supposed to test for powdery mildew. We had a lab up in Sacramento get popped. Right thing, or do we start on the research side where Duke just paid 120 million to the federal government for fraudulent research? If you talk about a place of fraudulent research, the food industry, there's a big, I think a Harvard professor who's come out a couple years ago and a big book on it. Basically, how the whole system is just a fraud, and that these small changes in these, you know, these standards are getting the results. These for-profit research institutions, which are our universities. You talk about the National Institute of Health. We've been fighting with them, with Sue Sisley. I've been working with since 2013. They don't give research in this country unless they want, they know what the answer they're going to give. That's why they only look at risk research on the, on the cannabis side. So the point is, is yes, that sounds great, but the reality is our system is nowhere near where it needs to be to provide the level of confidence that you're talking about. Then you get into things like cannabis hyper... Uh, Hypermesis. Hypermesis. Hyper Hyperemesis. I, I, I don't know what Lanny's opinion as a medical person. I'm not a medical person, but I smoked a lot of cannabis and been around a lot of <laughs> patients who smoke it. And this is the common answer we have, and it works 98% of the time. Whatever you're smoking, don't smoke it anymore. Get something else. Or where did that pipe or where did that instrument you're using? It's poisonous meds you're smoking, or it's a cheap pipe that has paint or some chemicals that's leaching into your system. That's our answer to it at the Weed for Warriors, and it almost works all the time. And so there's these, you know, quality of our meds is a huge issue. But then you get into what's the answer. And the answer, unfortunately, is in this big bureaucratic mess because it's not giving us what we want. 
and then it's denying us what we need, which is the medicine because it's increasing the cost through the roof. So I see a lot of very privileged groups in California talking about all these world things we need. No, we just need, we need flour. That's what we need. We need simple flour. That's right. You know, and we, you know, I don't think cannabis should be giving any more strength than tobacco. You inhale tobacco. So it should be about the same as tobacco, I would think, but it's not. Listen, we're running out of time. I want to thank the panelists to be here. You know, the, the overall goal of what we want to see happen is when you go to your doctor's office and you complain of pain or insomnia or depression or nausea or heaven knows what, except for maybe an infection. When you go to your doctor's doctor, the doctor, the first thing that doctor does as a first-line medication, they tell you to use cannabis for pain, for depression, for insomnia. Cannabis is going to work for most people. And in the few cases where it doesn't work, that's when the doctor turns to the more expensive, the more dangerous prescription pharmaceuticals. But cannabis is the first thing that a doctor would ever tell a patient to use for anything. Thank you very much for being here. We'll talk to you later.